Well, good morning. good morning. It's great to see each and every one of you here today as we kick off a new series entitled All In. And when you hear that phrase, I wonder where your mind goes uh, immediately. For me, it went to a, as I was making preparations for this message and kicking off this new sermon series, um, I immediately started thinking about um, an experience that I had several years ago as I was invited into a covenant group of other clergy who live across the state of Florida. And so we were gathered together. They were checking me out. I was checking them out to see if it would fit. And so it was an overnight retreat type of thing. And um, as we got together and after dinner, somebody suggested that we play some cards. And so, just as on a side note, I was, I was raised in the Baptist church, in a very conservative Baptist church, and they thought, I was always taught that cards are just evil, and you shouldn't be playing cards, you know, face cards, and, and, um, and so, make note of that experience, and that's all going on in my head, and uh, the irony is I'm with a group of United Methodist pastors, and they're all into, let's play a game of poker, and so I have no background on, on um, cards and stuff like that, so, so we sit down after dinner, and we start playing cards, and I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm kind of trying to learn as I go along, and watching the other guys, and, and finally, we got to a point where where, you know, we were asked the questions after we were dealt our hands, and, and I, I thought I had a great hand, you know, because um, I even had a queen, I had a king, you know, and, and um, I thought, certainly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this, I'm going to show these guys, you know, that I know more than what I let on to, and, and so, so as it, we were asked the familiar questions, do you fold or your pass, or hold or raise, and um, or do you, are you going to go all in? So when it got around to me, some people dropped out and said that they had a terrible, you know, hand, and and others just, uh, you know, held. But when it got around to me, I said, you know, I'm going all in. Well, um, one of my friends who was in the, another covenant brother who was in the circle, he said, he said, you know, I'm going to raise you. And so, and I had no clue what that meant. And so, and so I've just put everything on the line, you know, and, and he raises me. And so then we have to show our hand, of course. And um, Steve had a pair of aces. And so <laughs> he, he ended up uh, taking the game. You know, it's um, the lesson that I learned from that experience was in the game of poker, uh, when you don't understand the value of your, your cards, it, it makes a difference, doesn't it? It's not too smart. You know. you know, each day we're faced with a question, that simple question, hey, am I, I going to go in, all in? Am I going to give my all to this relationship that I've invested in? Am I going to give my all to this commitment that I've made? You see, another way of putting it is what we are committed to, or what are we committed to? What are you going to invest your time in? What are you going to invest your resources into? What are you going to invest your talents in? Webster's Dictionary says this about that phrase, all in. To be all in is to be fully committed to a task or endeavor, to give or to be prepared to give all of one's energy or resources towards something. Today we're celebrating, this weekend we've been remembering those who gave so much for the freedoms that you and I enjoy. I would say that they've gone all in. They've stepped in and they've totally dedicated and committed their lives to a cause. That's what we're talking about in this series is, is 
We all have to make that decision. Hey, am I going to give my time? Am I going to give my resources? Am I really all in in this journey? Jesus invites us to be all in. Throughout the Gospels, he invited people. Constantly, he was inviting persons to to come and to follow Jesus. To follow me, he would say. And they would have to make a decision. They would have to make a decision to, to leave everything. In fact, Scripture doesn't, he doesn't really negotiate with people. You know, if they're not feeling it and if they can't make the commitment that Jesus is asking for, he doesn't say, hey, let me just lower the bar. Um, Let's talk about this. He He didn't run after people. He put the invitation out there and it was clear. Hey, if you want to be one of my disciples, then come and follow me. Follow me. In the book of Acts, we read about how the early church was working hard to grow itself. They were um, to serve others and to, in the face of great opposition. Shortages of people and money, certainly we can relate to that. The men and the women are, are ready to do whatever it takes, though, to fulfill that mission that they've been called to live into. No work is too menial for the highest among them and no work too daunting for the lowliest. They were all in. You and I are beneficiaries of a group of people, the church down through the ages that has been all in, been willing to speak a voice of hope into a world that is broken, a world that has drifted off into to um, away from a relationship with Jesus. The church was a church of one heart and one soul. They were clear on mission. They were clear on the why. Nobody ever went without anything because everybody had settled, we're told, in the beginning book of Acts, we're told that everybody had settled the ownership question. God owned everything. We are just his managers. And that's key. That's key to to being all in. That's key to, to understanding if we're going to be faithful stewards of the message that Jesus has entrusted us with. You see, there was no lack as people sold their properties. They laid their gifts at the feet of the apostles. Talk about being all in. I can't even imagine doing that. They were fully convinced and committed to doing whatever it was going to take to share the message of hope. They fully believed that their message without it People were hopeless. Acts begins with a a post-resurrection interaction between Jesus and his disciples. Jesus teaches his disciples about the kingdom of God. They respond with a question. Maybe you're familiar with that passage. And and, um, they respond with this question. They say, is it time now? Are you going to finally come and set us free from Roman oppression? Are you going to finally set up that kingdom that we've been waiting for and give to us the power we deserve so that we can rule, so that we can finally get back at our enemies and put us in those rightful positions? But Jesus says, no, no. In fact, the kingdom that I've come to establish is a totally different type of kingdom. And he begins to unpack the vision of his kingdom. And and then he turns to them and he says, You, you are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, you 
You and I are a part of that story, that ongoing story of the church in this world, offering hope. We are the hope of the world because we are the body of Christ on earth, literally. That's what scripture teaches. The plan for the kingdom of God to become a reality is in and through the body of Christ, the church. You are going to be my witnesses. We are going to be his witnesses. You are going to show the world a better way. You are going to be about breaking down walls that divide people and, and bringing them together. You are going to speak up for the injustices in our world. You are going to stand with the oppressed. You are going to, to show people a new way of doing life together. I'm empowering you, Jesus says, to be faithful stewards of the mission of hope, love, and grace. I'm inviting you to go all in. Not only did Jesus empower them to change the world, he empowers us to, to do the same. God hasn't called us into just managing the church. Just keeping the machine going. You see, um, he hasn't called us to just playing church. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. You know, just kind of showing up, getting involved when it works for you, when you're feeling like that. And, but that's not a part of the calling of going all in. You see, he's expecting us to be fully devoted, committed, committed to his plans for this world and living out and making that vision, the kingdoms of God, a reality here, here on earth. You see, he expects and deserves our time, our talent, our treasure. He's the one who has entrusted us with it in the first place. Too many of us fail to realize that, that we're holding the winning hand. God has already given us everything. We see instead, we see the world as it's lacking. We see that we don't have enough, and yet Jesus is saying down through the pages of Scripture, we hear one story after another of how God has intervened with people who feel like, God, where are you? Things aren't going well. Um, we don't have enough, enough resources. We don't have enough um, status. We don't have enough people to fulfill this mission. And God says, if you rely on me, watch out. You'll see that you have more than enough. I believe that we are at one of those places in the life of our church. And the question before us all is, are you going to go all in? Do we truly believe what we say we believe? Do we truly believe that our community deserves a church that is willing to stand in the gap and to, to make a real difference as, as we continue to move forward? 137 years of ministry in this community through this church. Think about all the lives that this church has touched and changed and people's eyes of faith that have been open to a relationship with Jesus because that's what the church is all about. Paul was an all-in type of guy. In fact, his life had been so radically changed by Jesus that he throws caution to the wind and he's willing to go all in. And in Acts chapter 17, Paul is, is busy sharing, sharing the story of Jesus with the Athenians and, and he is, um, he's there in Athens and Dion and I were just recently there and, and we saw kind of what you know, the, um, those places where Paul would, 
walk in and, and he saw a wide variety of different religious practices and spiritualities that people were in. So they definitely were searching. He didn't go in there and waylay them and tell them you're all going to hell and in a handbag and you need to turn to Jesus. That wasn't his first thing. In fact, he walks in, we're told, in chapter 17, verses 22 through 23, and this is what he does. Paul then stands up, stood up in the meeting of the Arapagus and, and, and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. He's affirming what he can affirm. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. You see, Paul connects with them. He knows his context. He knows the setting. I was, I've been involved in a, a group of pastors. We get together in a phone conversation once a week. And a couple weeks ago, one of the pastors gave a devotional and on this passage, and he zeroed in on highlighting Paul walked around. He walked around. He knew his community. And I started thinking about that and asking myself that question. Do I know my community? Do I know the, the things that are heavy on people's hearts here in the city of Melbourne? Do we know what the needs are in the neighborhoods right around our church? Have we spent time walking around? A couple of years ago, I, um, I, I get energized in walking around. I just want to say that, and I'm, I'm, that's just the way I'm wired, getting to know people, getting to see what's going on in the community. And uh, several years ago, I really started to pay attention of what's going on in the downtown Melbourne area. And just the, all the conversation about the new buildings projected to come in and, and all the corporate reloads and all those various things that we've all heard about and read about in the papers. And, and um, some of those have taken place or are in process and some of those have, have not. But the question, as I've walked around and participated in some of those conversations and gone to, to city council meetings and heard about the different things, the question that I always walk away with is, how are we going to reach these people who have just moved into a, uh, now several years ago, but into the High Line, for instance, who are living in the High Line. It's fully full. You can't get an apartment in there. It's completely full. And I, I dare to venture that most of those people are going nowhere to church. Connected. I just um, think that's pretty, based on the stats that are out there. So the question is, how are we going to reach them? How are we going to reach um, people who are in the neighborhoods adjacent to us? Do we even know? How are we going to look like the diversity of Melbourne and represent that, or do we? How are we walking around getting to know our context? Paul also did a, a second thing that he did is he listened. He listened to the stories of the people. He, he didn't just rush in and tell them, this is what you need to do. He listened to their pain. He listened to their hurts. He listened to their struggles. He identified with them. 
I don't know about you, but when I hear people's story, I may walk into a conversation already figured out kind of what I think about this person or um, project upon this person. But once I hear a person's story and what they've had to deal with in life, it changes my opinion. It begins to move me. And I can meet them in their pain. And offer them hope. So this, Paul walked around, he looked, discovered the context that he was dealing with. He listened. He also learned. He also learned. You see, Paul didn't just, just go in there and decide to live out some amazing strategy that he had come up with before even arriving. He allowed the context to dictate the strategy. What I mean by that is sometimes the message of hope, the message of hope of Jesus never changes. But the methods that we use to reach people should always be changing because they're contextual. And so it's key before setting a strategy that we better be doing some walking around. We better be learning and listening to our community. What are the needs? Or we may be wasting a lot of energy and a lot of resources and just kind of propping up propping up strategies that just don't seem to be working anymore. You know, um, Paul learned that he needed to shift his strategy. Paul reminds us to learn from the context before you set the strategy. Our Jerusalem, our Jerusalem is Melbourne. Our Jerusalem is Melbourne. Jesus has empowered us together to reach this community with the love of Christ. How are we doing? Are we all in? Are we all in? You've been hearing about many different opportunities and, and many different ways to do just that. And this morning, I've asked um, a little earlier on this week, I asked Sherry Willingham if she would just um, come and just share very briefly about Sherry's, Sherry and Bartow both, along with others, have been, um, if you want to step over here into the light, we've got some lighting issues here. And so um, Sherry and Bartow and some others have been involved with Dinner Church on Tuesday nights. And if you've ever been there, you know it's an incredible, what God is doing in that place is incredible. And many of you have stepped up and done a phenomenal job in providing food and all of that kind of stuff. And so, um, yay God, that's been a big win for us. But I was there a few weeks ago and, and just hearing the story, Sherry ended up giving the message that night, the Jesus story. And I've been joking with her ever since. I'm going to put her up to preach. I mean, she did just this great job. But the questions that I wanted to ask you, Sherry, this morning is that um, what made you, what pulled on your heart to get you involved in dinner church in the first place? Well, if I remember, I believe dinner church started before COVID. And you and Dion had presented this concept of fresh expressions, which now we know as dinner church. And we mm -hmm. started off at University Park Elementary with a team of people. And University Park is a very multicultural school. So we had an opportunity to serve dinner, to break bread together, have communion, and to share a Jesus, a Jesus story with people who you would never even imagine would walk into our church. 
So what a great concept. I think of it as like a pop-up church. Mm -hmm. And we can have church anywhere. So I just thought it was a great idea to get involved. And then COVID happened, and we didn't get to go back to University Park anymore. Yeah. yeah. The, um, uh, how has God, since you've been involved with the dinner church here on Tuesday nights and um, with our um, NA group, and um, how has God used that experience to change you personally? Well, how, how much time do I get? You have <laughs> because I one really, <laughs> I really could, <laughs> I really could go on and on and on. But little did I know that the sermon series was called All In. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I didn't pay attention to your text message, <laughs> but um, Bartow and I and our team we are all in for dinner church. Wow. We are all in for N.A. Barto and I, we both have family members that have struggled mm -hmm. with addiction. We know many friends who have family members who have struggled mm -hmm. with addiction. And so it's opened our eyes to know that this can happen to anyone, anywhere, at any time. And we are just all in, and we firmly believe not only is our team all in, but our church is all in. We mm -hmm. feel it. We feel the presence of our church stepping up to the plate. We don't really have to beg for anything. People just out of nowhere show up and offer to bring food. In fact, someone this morning just approached me this morning and said, I just made a donation and designated it to the dinner church. And last wow. week after our... Uh, state of the church gathering, someone that I've never met before offered to bring a ham on Tuesday night, hmm. and boy, did we need it. And so we are all in, and more importantly, the NA group is all in. They are all in for recovery, they are all in for a good meal, and they most importantly are all in to hear a story about Jesus and how Jesus can help them through their addiction. Okay, well, thank you so much, Sherry, for sharing. Just as I wrap this up, I was having a um, lunch with a, a person who, who is a part of the um, Tuesday dinner church in, in, the, in the program there, and this person was just sharing with me how, um, how meaningful, the people who attend there, how meaningful that their, their lives are being changed. They're experiencing God's grace there. Now, it, it's messy. It's messy, but, um, but you know what? Jesus is present, and Jesus is moving. And beyond our structures and all of the things that we so oftentimes try to put together our plans, God is um, still moving. And that brings me to my conclusion this morning. Just, you know, you and I, we are children of the Wesleys. Now, you may be thinking, like, that's a weird that's a weird phrase. I don't see myself as a child of the Wesleys, but in the Methodist tradition, we are uh, the Wesley brothers. And those of you who have been around know the story of the Wesley brother brothers. But you know, as I was revisiting that story this past week, it's a powerful story about how John Wesley um, was converted as an Anglican priest he was converted as an Anglican priest, and he had his heart strangely warmed on Aldersgate, that street in, in London. And then a few weeks later, he's on Fetter Lane, and he is filled with the Holy Spirit. He has this Pentecostal experience. So he's initially met Jesus, opened his heart to Jesus, had this heartwarming experience. Then he is um, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he is, he's wondering, how am I going to reach my community? How am I going to contextually get people to show up? Because back then, the, the Anglican church was really not relating to the culture. 
In fact, there was, um, they were missing it. And so John Wesley was really burdened for his community, and he heard about a guy by the name of, of George Whitfield. Maybe you're familiar with George Whitfield if you know, um, if you're familiar with church history. And George Whitfield was contextually doing something that nobody had ever done before. He was going out into the fields and he was preaching to the people in the fields and he was gathering large groups of people. And so Wesley thought, man, I need to do that. I just need to kind of get dressed down a little bit and um, step out of my pulpit, my high pulpit, high church pulpit, and start identifying with regular people. And so he started preaching in the fields and people showed up and that sparked what is known as the Great Awakening that jumped across the pond and affected this country and Methodists were on the forefront of that because we were willing to know our context and we were willing to make the changes necessary to reach our community. This is kind of cool. Um, uh, John Wesley writes this. After that whole experience and after seeing um, what God was doing in those great outdoor events, he, um, he writes this in his journal on April 2nd, Monday, April 2nd. He writes in the 1700s, at four in the afternoon, at four in the afternoon, I submitted to be more vile and proclaim in the highways the glad tidings of salvation, speaking from a little eminence in a ground adjoining to the city to about 3,000, 3,000 people. He committed to being a little more vile because he was willing to do whatever it takes. He was all in to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Oh God, as we begin this series, as we look at our own hearts, as we look at where we are as a church, God, would you help us, convict us, convert us, draw us to be be willing to, to do whatever it takes to reach our community. Infuse us with a passion like we've never had before. God, infuse me with that passion. Fill me with your spirit. Help us to, to be done with playing church. And help us to be willing to go all in for Jesus.